It's absolutely wonderful to be here. To be lecturing in the Breastet Hall at the OI is the culmination of a dream, I would say. Uh, and especially to be talking about a book that I wrote using the archives here. And to be part of the David A. Kipper Ancient Israel Lecture Series is um, a distinct honor, and I'm so pleased that I was chosen for this. And I thank Barbara and everyone else. This was, as I was saying over at dinner, this is probably the book where I was the most sad when I finished it, knowing that it would come out and I had to stop work on it. So, but it's also fitting to be here talking about it because this is where it began. The OI gave me a collections grant in the spring of 2015. Uh, and it was while I was here that I lectured the last time. <clears throat> but it was what I found in the archives that led to the book becoming what it is. So, and I've got a couple other fellowships as well, but it was really the OI's collection grant that started me. Uh, and everyone here has been so absolutely phenomenal. So I put the names uh, on here, but I really, I could not have done this without Anne Flannery and a thousand heartfelt thanks to her, uh, as well as, <clears throat> sorry, see, I got off for a clamp there, uh, as well as everyone else that has done this. So thank you so much. Actually, the book that you will hopefully purchase tonight and or read is not the book I started to write. When I got here, I was going to write a completely different book. And you can actually see up top in the white there, that was the title that I sent in for my proposal for the collections grant. It was going to be an archaeological history of Megiddo through the ages. And even for the NEH, it was also, it was going to go level by level, tell you all the archaeology, this, that, and the other. But what I found here caused me to change the approach. So that's in part what I'm going to talk to you about. But let me just say, for most of you here, I don't have to give Megiddo uh, an introduction. You know all about it. But uh, we have quite a few people on the YouTube that it may be new to. So let me simply say this is a picture of Megiddo, Tel El Muta Salem, before excavation. This was taken at about 1903 or thereabouts. And you can see there are two levels to the mound. Within that mound are 20 different layers, some of them subdivided even further. And uh, it is inhabited from about 5000 BCE down to 350 BCE, give or take. Let's just say by the time Alexander the Great comes through the region in about 332, Megiddo was abandoned for all intents and purposes, and the Romans lived off the mound uh, nearby, but not on the mound. So it's got about 5,000 years of history. It's basically from the Neolithic period down through the Persian period. Uh, it is wonderfully situated if you want to control things. Uh, Megiddo is in the Jezreel Valley. It's on the Via Maris, the way of the sea. And basically, if you want to get from Egypt up to Mesopotamia or up to Anatolia, if you want to go in modern terms from Egypt up to Turkey or Iraq, you've got to go right past Megiddo. Uh, even today, it's still um, fairly central. You can see it uh, on the maps right there. And Tutmosis III, who fought, I would say, the first recorded battle that was uh, fought there in 1479 BCE, give or take, he said the capturing of Megiddo is like the capturing of a thousand cities. And so pretty much anybody who's invaded the region has come through and has fought a battle in or near Megiddo. From Tutmosis III through most of the biblical characters, Deborah and Barak and Gideon and even Saul and Jonathan. And boy, who wasn't there? Um, the Crusaders were there. Mamluks were there. Napoleon was there. And even uh, Allenby, the lower right picture there, the man with the feathers. So lots of battles that have been fought there, but probably the most famous and the one that everybody knows about would be a little battle known as Armageddon, mentioned in the um, New Testament, Revelation 16, 16. And in fact, the word Armageddon comes from the Hebrew, Har Megiddo, the mound or mountain of Megiddo. So originally it was um, Har Megiddo, then it goes to Har Megiddo. They lose the H, they actually 
add the N as well, and we get Armageddon today. So most people don't realize that Armageddon is a real place, but it is, and it is the site of Megiddo. So there have been four sets of excavators that have been there so far. Gottlieb Schumacher came there first, 1903 to 1905. Then came the Chicago team that will be at the focus of our discussions tonight. They were there from 1925 to 39. Uh, they are the ones responsible for what Megiddo looks like today. They took off the top couple of layers and went down to bedrock in another place. Then Yigal Yudin was there in the 1960s and 70s with his graduate students, try asking and answering some questions. And then the Tel Aviv Consortium first actually went there in 1992 and then started an international consortium in 1994, which is when I joined the project. And I was there from 94 until 2014, uh, as was said in the introduction. Now, and we actually have members in the audience that were there um, just as long. And you can see Israel Finkelstein on the far right and David Yushishkin on the left and in between, Norma Franklin, who is out there in the audience somewhere here. There she is. So Norma was there. And Norma actually also, kudos, I couldn't have written the book without you. So Norma knows more about Megiddo than anybody alive, including myself. And I, as I said, I was there 20 years. Uh, there I am with little Hannah. On the left, we, she was wearing a cut-down T-shirt that said, I've survived Armageddon. My trowel is almost as big as her. She was 18 months old at the time. She's now 26 and is watching, so hi, Hannah. Uh, and so Megiddo has been near and dear to me for most of my life. So as I said, when I retired in 2014, I wanted to write a book about Megiddo, I wanted to do the archaeology layer by layer by layer, and that was why I applied for the collections grant. So I came here in 2015, I went down into the archives, and I proceeded to find things that I never expected to find. I thought I would find things like the dig director's diaries, and the photographs, and the, the levels, and the notebooks. What I didn't expect to find were the cables the telegrams that went back and forth, the personal letters, the photographs, the story behind the stories. And so I decided right then and there that I had to change the book and that I would have to write as much about the archeologists as I did about the archeology. span And in fact, um, what I used as kind of my template is a book that probably many of you have read, and if you haven't read it, you need to, and that is James Mitchner's book, The Source. And in that book, he alternates chapters between the archaeologists and the archaeology. And so I tried to do the same in mine. So when I'm talking about a period from, say, 1931 to 34, one chapter's on the archaeologists and everything that was going on, and the next chapter's on what they actually found. I knew already that Rockefeller had funded the dig to the tune of $215,000 for the first five years, which doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that's $2 million in today's uh, terms, uh, and that it was, in fact, Allenby that told him to go dig at Megiddo. So Allenby had fought a major battle here uh, in uh, 19, uh, sorry, here being Megiddo, not in Chicago, <laughs> fought a major battle back in 1918 using Breasthead's ancient records of Egypt to recreate what Tutmosis III had done in 1479 with the same successful results in 1918. So round about 1919 into 1920, when Breasthead was looking around for a site to excavate, Allenby said, well, why don't you dig at Megiddo and look for Tutmosis III? And Alan, uh, Breasthead said, that's a great idea, and I can also see if I can find Solomon while I'm at it. So that's how all of this came about. As a result, in addition to the archives here, I thought, well, maybe there's correspondence on the other side. You're asking a donor for lots of money. There are letters flying back and forth. Sure enough, at the Rockefeller Archive Center in Sleepy Hollow, New York, which is, I think, better known for the Headless Horseman, they have the archives there. And there were all the letters back and forth. I found a lot of breasthead stuff at the Rockefeller. And then the IAA, the Israel Antiquities Authority, has put most of their records online here from British Mandate Palestine, and there are a lot of Megiddo materials there as well. So all of that led me 
towards the book that, that you are holding or will hold, but also something unexpected happened. While I was writing it, I did a search on Ancestry.com, which some of you may be familiar with. Just for fun, I'm an amateur genealogist for our family. And I thought, let me try searching for some of the Megiddo staff members. Lo and behold, I found their descendants, contacted some of them, and they all had material that had been left to them by their parents or grandparents, as the case may be. And others read the book and contacted me after it came out. So these, for example, you're the first uh, crowd to basically see these. Um, uh, ja Jackie Shipton Gooder uh, said, I, I contacted her. She's like, I don't have much from my father, uh, Jeffrey Shipton, but I have our cousin's album, Harry Parker. And I'm like, you have Harry Parker's photo album? <laughs> he was there from 1928 to 1955. And she's like, yeah, you want to see it? I'm like, sure. She shipped it over to me from England. And I took high resolution photos, shipped it back to her, got permission, and these will now be part of the OI's photo archive. So these are things that people have never really seen before. Um, and so we have like a dinner parties, and we have even a visit from Flinders Petrie and Hilda as well, uh, and even a before and after from a Christmas party <laughs> with no date on it, but I looked through all the diaries and this and that and I found it has to be 21st of December, 1929 because the day after several of the people in this picture went down to Port Said for the Christmas holidays. So I know the date it's gotta be. Um, identifying the people was a little bit more difficult, but I think we've got them as well. So I've been having a bit of fun with this, as you know, but this, these pictures are not in the book. They'll have to be in volume two whenever that comes out. So at any rate. And I also got other pictures as well, courtesy from here, from the OI and Oberlin and Jackie Shipton Gooder and some that Norma uh, was able to send me. So the workmen, the invisible excavators, the hidden hands, the people that are not acknowledged in the final reports, but did all the work, both the Gufties from Egypt and the local villagers from the village of Lejeune and elsewhere. These are the people that made this possible and dug for 15 years. So I'm actually working on an article right now uh, to give them their voice back. And I've actually been able to find the names of many of the Gufties from Egypt, these workers that came up. But um, yesterday morning in the archives, I found a list of the local villagers that worked at Megiddo 1938 to 39. And so I haven't even had time to, to look at more than just, oh wow, there's the names of some of the people. So stay tuned. So lots more to come. All right, and here are then some of these Gufties that came up from Egypt. They are originally trained by Petrie as well as George Reisner and others. Uh, and these, um, Norma sent me this picture of the Gufties lined up. Judging from the state of the dig house, it has to be 1925 or 1926, something like that. Uh, but we're, we're still working on this. And we've got others now as well with Ali the pot mender and his assistant Mahmoud Salama who helped the photographer Olaf Lind, Abu Youssef who is simply called the rod man in the records and it's because he held the stadia rod while they were doing all the measuring. So all the, the behind the scenes thing. And what it meant that was for me, plain and simple, what had just been names on the cover pages of the books or in footnotes or on the spines suddenly became actual people. I had never really thought about this, but they became three-dimensional, they came to life. And so we lived in our house for like five years with Robert Enberg and Robert Lamont and Olaf Lind and Ruby Woodley and the others. They were constant companions at the, at the dinner table. Uh, but I also discovered that there was a lot I didn't know about it, the story behind the stories, and that's what I want to spend the rest of the time presenting to you, is basically my top 10 list of what I did not know about Megiddo, but was absolutely, I thought, fascinating. So fact number one, there were three field directors, Fisher, Guy, and Loud, that went one after the other from 1925 to 1939, 
you can see Clarence Fisher on the left, PLO guy in the middle, and then Gordon Loud on the right. Not one of the three was actually trained as an archeologist. And I was absolutely shocked by that until I realized that at that time there weren't that many people being trained officially as archeologists, and yet, but what happened was that I found out it made sense. Fisher and Loud were both architects, which is very good to be on an excavation. And Guy, even though he never, he went to both college and I think it was law school, never finished either one, but was originally a photographer with Sir Leonard Woolley at Carcamis. So he had field training. But no matter what, the team that they put together was one of the best to dig in the Middle East at the time. So um, apparently he didn't have to be an archeologist. Fact number two that really surprised me is the dig actually almost never happened. It almost ended a week into the first dig season when Fisher sent, actually cabled, a resignation letter back to Breasted saying that he couldn't work with a guy named Higgins. And this must have shocked Breasted just a little bit. So here is Fisher uh, at work uh, in, I think, in Jerusalem. Here's the staff that was there with them. It was a very small team those first um, year or two. Clarence Fisher brought his nephew, who had the same name, but was known as Stanley. Then there's um, Daniel Higgins. He was the cause of the problem. He's the surveyor or cartographer. And then Ed Deloche, who had been a student here uh, at University of Chicago, came to help Higgins. And then John Payne Kellogg, who actually was um, associated with the OI for a very, very long time uh, in the memberships and such. So this was the, the group that was there. Uh, once Breasted got the telegram, he reacted uh, as, as you might expect. He said, under no circumstances can you resign. You've only been there like a month digging. So deeply regret trouble, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I am cabling Higgins. He is not in charge. And so it seemed to be a bit of a problem when you only have four or five people and two of them think they're in charge, that that can be a bit of a problem. And that apparently solved the problem. Fisher, who had run away to Jerusalem, Fisher cabled back, thanks for the message. Um, that's okay, I won't quit. And it went on from there. Um, but in the meantime, Higgins got his wrist slapped, shall we say. And he would eventually, down the line, get fired. So all of these I found in the archives. Within, I would say, the first like half an hour of being there, back in 2015, and I just sat and went, this is gonna be interesting. So sure enough, it absolutely was. So fact number three, actually might not surprise you too much. When they first got there, they had to live in tents while they were waiting for their dig house to be built. This was not uncommon at the time. But what was uncommon, I would say, is that their meals at lunch and dinner were five and seven courses including afternoon tea. And I don't know about you, but I've never been on an excavation that had a five course meal or a seven course meal. And uh, Ed Deloche, who was very young at the time, wrote back to his mother in October 1925, describing this. And he said, like, even though there are tents, um, we've got mosquito nets, we've got soft mattresses, each of us has a private wash stand, uh, and lunch is five courses, dinner is seven, and in the afternoon at four, tea is served. So you see, we are living in great style, to which I would say, yes, you were. <laughs> so, but hard on that fact, because they were in tents and not in a house, that um, the malaria set in. The Jezreel Valley was very swampy at the time. It hadn't yet been drained. It would be drained in a couple years after they got there with Rockefeller money. And in fact, in the Rockefeller archives, I found this map that you see on the left marking the malarial areas in British Mandate Palestine, uh, and they gave money to help them be drained. But you can see on the right, this is kind of, it's kind of hard to see, but their car is stuck in the mud. Uh, in the Jezreel Valley, that's how much uh, it was wet. And at one point, they, everybody had malaria. So when the British High Commissioner came to visit, the Gufties and the local workmen were up on top excavating completely unsupervised because everybody was down in their beds with malaria. So that, that took a couple of years for them to get uh, rid of that. But uh, again, in the archives, we have a letter from John Garstang, uh, who was 
director of the British School uh, in Jerusalem at the time, and also I believe by that point was the director of antiquities. And he went on up and then he wrote back to Breasted and just said, you know, everybody's ill, uh, and especially Fisher, and he must knock off or you will bury him. Uh, and indeed, uh, Fisher is going to uh, be reassigned fairly soon after that because he never really did recover from the malaria. But in the meantime, Brest had decided he needed to see what was going on <clears throat> at there, uh, going on at that point. And so this is a visit from March 1926, and you can see the truck that is there uh, and some of the labels uh, that we've got from Barbara Keller and from Norma Franklin identifying who is there. And so basically the boss came to visit in March 1926. So while he was there, this is where we get to fact number five, they told him that they had found a rock that they had brought down from Schumacher's earlier excavations and that one of the Egyptian workmen had recognized that there were hieroglyphics on the rock. And it turns out when Breste got there, he read it and he said, oh, that's Sheshank, biblical Shishak, uh, and this is newsworthy, and indeed it did make um, papers around the world. Um, <clears throat> what they didn't tell him was they had actually found it like five months earlier. They had found it back in November and just kind of hadn't bothered to tell him about it. And then when he got there in March, they're like, oh yeah, that thing that's propping open the door? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and, and for some reason that fact is never mentioned in any of the publications that it had been found like five months earlier. So... <clears throat> At any rate, we get the story from Higgins, who was kind of spilling the beans uh, to D.D. Luckenbill, who was teaching here at the OA at the time. And he said in the letter, of course, you've heard about the Shishak Steely. Breasted did not seem too pleased that it had been resting here since last November without his hearing about it. And that, when I was reading the letter in the archives, I went, oh, there's a story there. So but I don't know much more about it than that. All I know is that when they released the news, it, as I said, it made um, headlines around the world, and Breasted simply said when he got there in the spring of 1926, he was informed, uh, and indeed, uh, he had been. So, uh, and this really put Megiddo on the map uh, in terms of the world's interest, I would say. That was the first announcement that they made. The problem was, that the stone, when they had found it, had been, as I mentioned, in Schumacher's back dirt pile. That is, the first excavation, 1903 to 1905, had been the one to find the stone, but had missed it, and they had thrown it out, and it was on their back dirt pile. So of the 20 levels at Megiddo, we don't know what level it was found in. If we did know, we could probably know the level that would be associated with Solomon, because well, at least the biblical account says that Shishak comes up and attacks this whole region just after Solomon has died. So if Schumacher had found it, we might know more about it. But he didn't, and so we've um, still been searching. And in fact, uh, at one point, we were looking for more fragments, never did find them. Uh, Norma is pretty sure where they are, but we haven't found them yet. So we'll see, one of these days. At any rate, they then got bigger more um, staff members, more Egyptian workmen, more local villagers starting in the fall of 1926. You can see them all here with Clarence Fisher in the middle uh, and then all the gufties on the back. And actually this particular photograph does have all the names on the back. So we actually do know the names of everyone from the staff to the workmen. And then I just thought I would put this together. This is the dig house over the years uh, as it grew, uh, and indeed there's still portions of it there at the site. Not much of it left, but if you go to the welcome center, the guest house, the rest house, where all the bathrooms and the gift shops are, that's the remnants of the um, Chicago dig house. A and indeed, it was quite amazing, apparently. Uh, we're told by Betty Murray, who visited in 1933. She had been digging over at Samaria with the Crowfoots and a young lady known as Kathleen Kenyon, uh, who was on one of her first digs at the time. And she wrote home to her mother in 1933 saying, 
it was worth going there, that is over to Megiddo, just to see how an expedition can be conducted when money is no object. So they had separate photography rooms, they had all sorts of things, and you can see it was absolutely gorgeous with the gardens uh, in front and others in back. Well, Fisher was replaced by Guy fairly soon, PLO Guy, and Guy was there 1927 to 1934. We've got the correspondence with the firing and hiring of the dig directors. Basically, uh, Breasted did it in one fell swoop. Uh, Fisher wasn't actually kind of fired. He was promoted out of active digging, uh, became kind of an advisor. But PLO guy then became the active field director and was immediately faced with a rebellion by the Gufties. They had come to the site that year. This is spring 1927. They had been expecting to work for Fisher, but Fisher had been replaced like a week, 10 days beforehand. And so they're like, well, we don't really want to work for this guy that we don't know. They had all known Fisher personally. And so while they were at it, they demanded higher wages. So Guy simply let the six ringleaders go, just let them go, uh, and then requested that they never work in Palestine again. In fact, they did. Um, a number of them went over to Tel and Nazba, which Bade was excavating, uh, and kept working with him for the next 10 years and beyond, uh, in particular Labib Soriel and William Gad. So Guy's directorship got off to a bit of a rocky start, but he quickly made the system his own. Uh, he appointed some of his own people, though Breasted did have a tendency to keep sending people over from Chicago that Guy hadn't asked for, and Guy had no say in the matter. But he did have a couple of his own people, and this is where uh, it gets, I think, rather interesting. You see circled on the left there, that's Harry Parker, whose photo album showed up courtesy of Jackie Shipton uh, Gooder. Uh, he's 28 years old at the time. He was a decorated British Army vet, and he had been a police officer in British Mandate Palestine and quickly became Guy's right-hand man. He ran everything, right? He's like the major domo back at the dig house. And indeed, when the dig ended, he stayed on and looked after the property uh, right up until 1954 or so. So he became a major player. Uh, in addition, on the far right, Jeffrey Shipton, wh who was his cousin, he came to Megiddo when he was 17 years old as a high school dropout and never did finish uh, either high school or college. In fact, he applied to the University of Chicago several times, including with Breasted's recommendation, and the university never let him in because he hadn't finished high school. But um, he co-authored the Megiddo One volume, uh, and um, along with Robert Lamont, who you see uh, next to him, the other red circle, he was a 22-year-old undergraduate here at Chicago, member of Beta Theta Pi, and um, took a break from college. He was a major in geology, later finished his degree by coming back for one quarter and then doing correspondence, but the two of them, that's Lamont and Shipton, the authors of Megiddo One, which absolutely shocked me uh, when I found out about that. But basically, they had training on the spot. They learned it right there in the field. And between the two of them, they wrote, Lamont and Shipton wrote or co-authored five of the publications, which is the same number as Fisher, Guy, and Loud together wrote, which I think is rather interesting and impressive. So immediately after he brought these new people in, um, he was responsible for Parker and Shipton, and Lamont got sent to him from Chicago. That was when they found Solomon Stables in June 1928. And there was a wonderful cable where Guy sent a cable to Breasted, and in part he said, um, I believe I found Solomon Stables. Uh, there's the cable on the left, the longer version. And what I love about this is there is Breasted's cable on the right for something he had been waiting for about eight years for by this point, and it's a one-word telegram. He simply says, congratulations. 
that was it. You can't get more understated than that, all right? But um, in fact, he is looking at um, two passages from the Hebrew Bible, both from 1 Kings, uh, and they literally thought they had found Solomon's stables. And so he wrote to John D. Rockefeller Jr. with the news, right? Always let the donor know before anybody else knows, uh, and then released it out into the wild. And articles appeared in the New York Times, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and elsewhere. Uh, if you're wondering why St. Louis was picking it up, that's where Stanley Fisher was from, Clarence's nephew. So there was a hometown interest there. But of course, we've got questions today that are still being asked. First of all, are they actually stables? I think they are, but, uh, and to when do they date? Are they actually Solomon's? Are they Ahab Omri? Are they Jeroboam II? And this is still being debated. So, but still, this was the second thing that put Megiddo on the map in, term of, in terms of the general population. And he piqued the interest of John D. Rockefeller Jr., who came on what they called the Great Royal Visit in March of 1929. And you see here most of the Rockefeller party, uh, including um, the great man himself, standing next to Breasted. Let's see, there they are. There's Breasted and John D. Rockefeller Jr. Uh, and Abby Rockefeller is in there as well. So is Todd Clark and, and so on. So this was uh, a major visit. They prepared for a very long time for it. Uh, here's another photograph showing um, the, actually a lecture being given on the site. And out of all of this then, um, I found the diary that John D. Rockefeller Jr. was keeping at the Rockefeller archives. And this is what he wrote. Friday, March 8th, um, left at 9 a.m., drove to the Oriental Institute of Chicago's house at Megiddo, which he had a little trouble spelling. Uh, Mr. Guy in charge, Mr. Noble, the English road engineer and wife, also there, saw excavation of Solomon Stables, Left after lunch over same new road to highway near Haifa, then back through Nazareth, and on three quarters of an hour to Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. That's it. A half a page and a little tiny notebook for a dig that he had spent the equivalent of $2 million on. So I'm not sure how impressed he was, but he was in a hurry. We'll give him that. So anyway, and in the meantime, big things were going on back home in terms of selling shares in oil companies and such. Anyway, so the, the major man came that year. Uh, and a little bit later then, here's a staff photo from 1929. Uh, and we've got not only PLO guy, but his wife, Yamima, shown. Now let's see if we can spotlight them. Right there, there's PLO and Yamima. She was the daughter of the man who basically invented modern Hebrew. So guy who was not Jewish himself, married into basically the highest levels of society in this region. That made it rather interesting because um, Harry Parker was, shall we say, rather anti-Semitic, rather rabidly anti-Semitic. And there we are with the PLO guy and Yamima running the dig. So uh, there were some interesting back and forth there. But we can also see Rais Hamid in the back. Uh, and then uh, my absolute favorite, Ed Deloche right there, uh, and he is always wearing the two-tone shoes. Next to him is his brand new wife, Florence. They got married when she came to visit the dig. This actually caused a bit of problems. Nobody knew they had been dating back here in Chicago. They thought he had just met her and had proposed and gotten married within a week. They didn't realize it was kind of the culmination, but um, I'm in charge with, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in contact with their daughter who sent me the letters and the diaries and I managed to figure out the full story which you can read about in the book. But they got married in Jerusalem. Here's the Deloche wedding, which by the way, the guys did not come to because they did not approve of it, but never mind. Everyone else from Megiddo is in the, uh, the picture on the left. All right, onwards. Um, one of the things that they found out when Guy took over is that they had been paying rent to the wrong people for the last three years. 
Fisher had signed an agreement back in 1925, which ran out in 1928 to rent the land on which they could dig. Uh, and when they went to renew it, they were informed that they had been paying the wrong people. And in fact, they needed to pay this woman, Rosamond Dale Owen Oliphant Templeton, um, an American living in England who had married the Scottish travel writer, Lawrence Oliphant, uh, and he had bought a portion of Megiddo decades earlier. So you see here on the right, the plaque that is in New Harmony, Indiana, but she is actually buried in Wales. Um, in the end, Chicago bought her portion for $3,500, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually kind of was. And my favorite quote in all of this actually comes back from 1903 when Schumacher first started excavating. The London Daily News asked her, how much of Armageddon do you own, Mrs. Templeton? And she said, about 1,200 acres, and it's the central and best part. So they had to negotiate with her. It made the New York Times when they bought it. This is first December 1930. And I figured out that $3,500 back then is worth uh, about $48,000 in today's money. So she made um, a, a good profit, shall we say. Uh, and this allowed them then to start digging all over the mound, uh, where they had been a little bit limited earlier. And so this is when they start finding things like the water tunnel in 1930. There's not much of a backstory here. They dug, um, they dug the tunnel, except for the fact that they weren't expecting it. And when they dig, when they did dig it, it went so deep, it's basically 100 feet straight down and then 300 feet straight out, that they had to run cables for electricity, which was fairly new to the site at the time. And they ran it down into the tunnel, not just for light, but for ventilation. They had huge fans going because the workmen were fainting from the bad air down there. Um, it worked. They managed to do well. I think at one point, though, somebody dropped three buckets of dirt on Rais Hamid's head from the top of the shaft down to the bottom. I think they find that workman and it never happened again. But on the whole, they were able to do it. But again, um, Guy and the others said we couldn't have done this without the resources uh, that, the, that Chicago was sending our way. And they actually even, um, this telegram, uh, mentions a skeleton that they found. There we go right there. Towards the end, and they made up a whole wonderful story about the watchman and being killed at his post and this and that. But the newest re-evaluation uh, re is that it, this might actually be a middle bronze tomb that was accidentally discovered when they were digging the water tunnel originally. So Yigal Yadin thought that this dated to like the Iron Age or King Solomon. Uh, I'm tending more towards putting it back in the late Bronze Age or maybe even Middle Bronze Age, which is what the tunnel at Gezer looks like it is. So anyway, still debates about this, but it, very interesting reading just about what it took to excavate the water tunnel. And at the same time, they were also excavating what's known as the Burt City, Stratum 6A, uh, and this is a rather well-known stratum. In fact, Tim Harrison published this as uh, his dissertation and then a book that is a level where the entire city is burnt. All the, the mud brick is burnt. There are pottery shattered everywhere. There are dead bodies everywhere. It's very clear that that whole stratum was destroyed. Uh, you can see even here some of the skeletons. There must have been some survivors because some came back and tried to put like shattered pots on top of the bodies, but most of the people seem to have uh, either died or left, but they even were able to find burnt wooden posts still in C2. Unfortunately, you know, if we found this today, they would be off for radiocarbon dating, right? We'd probably send them to Felix to ask them what date they are, uh, and we would be doing all kinds of things. With, uh, with the DNA and the skeletons. But back then, not so much, unfortunately. But Herbert May and William Irwin, who were members of the staff at the time, they at first said it was Philistines that did it. 
had to have been the Sea Peoples and the Philistines. But then they changed their mind and said it was probably an earthquake. Uh, and in fact, I would agree with them. There's a lot of question about who destroyed this stratum. But um, when I was going there, I took a look at this one wall. Uh, and having grown up in California, I'm like, that's what a wall looks like after an earthquake. So I think that the site was destroyed by Mother Nature, not by humans, which means that the original um, staff musings in the 1930s were probably correct. Now, not everybody agrees, and, and we can have a nice debate about it, but I'm going to stick to my guns, and it's an earthquake. In any event, Herbert May, who we just mentioned as one of the people that thought it was an earthquake, he left Megiddo in July 1934. He'd been offered a job at Oberlin, uh, and he was headed out, and uh, in his suitcase had what we would today call a study collection. A bunch of sherds, some flakes, a couple things he had bought down in Jerusalem. Um, but when he got to customs at the port in Haifa and they asked, do you have anything to declare? Do you have any antiquities? He said, no. And I presume he's thinking, look, it's just a study collection. It's discards from, you know, after we look at them. So he said no. Um, well, that was probably not the thing to do. He probably should have said, I don't have antiquities, but I've got a study collection or something like that. So Guy sent a telegram to Breasted saying that May had been um, arrested and fined for smuggling antiquities. Uh, and followed it up with a letter that was later said by James Henry and Charles Breasted to be the most scurrilous letter this institute has ever received. Now, of course, my ears perked up at that. I'm like, what do you say in a letter to make it scurrilous? Well, unfortunately, as you can see on the right there, where that letter should be in the archives is a note saying it was removed and was in Charles's personal file. We have never yet found this to the best of our abilities, right? Anne and I were looking for it this afternoon again. It'll show up somewhere. It'll probably be in a mental envelope labeled confidential. So if you find it, please let me know. I'm really curious as to what it said because it got Guy fired. That is why Guy was fired. And in fact, by the time Breasted got the cable and the letter, he already knew what had happened because Irwin had already written to him and had said that Guy was called when this was going on at the port and was asked, are these antiquities? And he said, yes. Are they valuable? He shrugged his shoulder and said, who's to say whether they are or not? I don't know, or words to that effect. If he had given the entire honest answer says Irwin, which obviously he was fully competent to give. If he had said, no, they're just fragments, the affair would have ended right there. But he didn't. He didn't back up May. And so as a result, Guy was fired the end of August. And Le Mans, remember Le Mans, our geology major, he was appointed temporary field director. So it was during that interim, which was like the first study season that they had had in years, Lamont and Shipton were tasked with writing the Megiddo One volume. And as they were gathering all the data, they concluded that Fisher and Guy had missed an entire layer and had left out an entire city. Now, in fact, Fisher and Guy had noticed it. They called it the scrappy city, but they hadn't given it a number at that time and hadn't really included it in their thoughts and deliberations and in fact had assigned some of the buildings to layers either above it or below it. So Lamont and Shipton sent a letter back to Breasted. You can see a quote on the right. Naturally, the situation is causing us considerable consternation and we should very much appreciate your help and instructions in the matter. And in the end, they pretty much tried to rewrite everything, uh, and as a result, came out with Megiddo 1. But this, which is stratum 4, stratum 5, 4A, 4B, 5A, 5B, is still probably the hottest bone of contention uh, in the levels at Megiddo. What goes with what, what happens there, uh, and so on. 
Uh, and in fact, David Yushishkin, uh, who was uh, co-director at Megiddo for years and years uh, from the beginning of the project until about 2010, uh, he's now suggested that that level, the scrappy city, Stratum 5b, might be Solomon's. But um, there are a number of different other suggestions, and in fact, that's kind of the subtext in my book throughout it is which of the levels uh, at uh, Megiddo is Solomon's. Spoiler alert, I make a suggestion, but I don't solve it. So somebody in the future is going to have to solve it. But anyway, so this brings us then we're getting close to the end, don't worry. Um, to the loud years, 1935 to 1939, they finally settled on him as a replacement for PLO guy. He had actually already been digging for the OI. He was in charge of the excavations at Horsabad up in Iraq, and they brought him down. They closed those excavations, brought him uh, and some of his team members, Charlie Altman and Alice Altman, to join the people at Megiddo. But Jeffrey Shipton was still there, Robert Lamont was still there, and Harry Parker was still there. But you notice we've only got six people there at the time. They're basically at their lowest level since 1925. Right? They've got very few staff. But Loud had all kinds of new ideas. He opened up um, trenches in three different areas. Uh, and this is what we've still got today with areas A, A, B, B, and C, C. And while digging in BB, which they eventually took all the way down to bedrock, that's how we know there are 20 levels there, in um, Temple 2048, they found the famous statue, which is up on display, if I'm not mistaken, in the Megiddo galleries. Uh, and this was um, something that Brest had been waiting for, but he never heard the news. He had died one week earlier. He had been visiting Megiddo and the other digs, and on his way back, uh, had caught sick. He got um, basically strep throat, the equivalent thereof, and malaria, and they were not able to, um, to save him. And so when he got back to New York, he died there early December 1935. Uh, he got a half a page in the New York Times, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and all of that. But that also threw the dig and the OI into disarray, uh, at least for a while. And eventually John Wilson will step in as the director. But as a result, they almost closed down Megiddo. Uh, in May 1936, there are a series of um, cables that go flying back and forth, and they were ordered to terminate the excavation and to liquidate everything. Sell the dig house, sell all the equipment, everything like that, um, for financial reasons. But the cable that they sent back is, OK, we'll do it, but we can't do it now. Uh, it's not the right time. It's not the right conditions, because the Arab revolt had just broken out. And it was going to last 1936 to 1939. So while they were waiting for the right time to liquidate the dig, an unexpected windfall of $50,000 came through, which was enough for two more seasons of excavation. And that is why they were able to keep digging. If they had stopped when they were supposed to, they would never have found the ivories. Because the Megiddo ivories were found in the spring of 1937. They were found in this, in what's called the treasury, just to one side of the city gate. Uh, here it is on the left, viewed from the south. And a diagram that was drawn, a hand diagram, and you can see most of the ivories are in the back room. And they actually did what we would call today microgridding, where they split it into one meter by one meter, so they knew where each of the ivories came from. Uh, and of course, you, I, you are familiar with all of these, so I won't belabor the point. You can just go to the galleries if you want. Um, but in the archives here and in the IAA archives are the original lists of the ivories uh, as they came out of the ground. And in fact, we've got letters back and forth from Loud to Wilson uh, and so on, naming the discovery of the ivories, and in particular the fact that they were very, very confused by the camel that they found on top of them. And that was the point where I'm reading through these and going, wait, there was a camel on top of the ivories? I've never heard that. 
But sure enough, that's what Loud wrote both in the letters and in his field diary. Um, strange burial, camel's head, possibly a complete camel, two human skulls, some human ribs, so on and so forth. Next day, skeletons, there are two of them, skeletons number two, one child, one young camel, two additional skulls. What a strange assortment it all is. And I think you would agree, it's rather strange to find a camel in a subterranean basement. And when asked how they got there, uh, Loud said, maybe they wandered in during the destruction of the palace, because this is in about 1200 BCE. Or he said, or they were caught stealing and were executed on the spot. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe the kid is stealing, but I've never heard of a thieving camel. So that was a bit strange. At any rate, they kept writing back and forth and writing back and forth. And in the final reports, this gets just like a sentence. And people just go right by and don't even notice. Wait, there's a camel in there. Well, uh, actually, I don't think it's a camel. And I don't think it's a treasury. There's no obvious access. Uh, the ivory objects are all topsy-turvy and broken up. And there are, in fact, pieces in one of the other three rooms that match up in between. There are fragments from more than one human skeleton. Most of the objects are pushed to the very back. Some of you are nodding. You know where I'm going with this. There are one or more animal skeletons present as well. It's not a thieving camel. It's not a prince who collected ivory, which was suggested in the final report. Um, and I asked a couple years ago, uh, Haskell Greenfield and Tina Greenfield, <clears throat> I showed them the picture and they said, that's not a camel. That's an equid of some sort. It's like a, a donkey. And we see these burials all the time, and mostly in early Bronze Age, middle Bronze Age. It's a bit rare to see them in late Bronze Age, but they said that's what it looks like to them. So I think this is a tomb. It's not a treasury, it's a tomb. There's multiple interments over time. The earliest burials are pushed to the back, and then you would sacrifice like a donkey or whatever in there. So I think it's a tomb, and there's a parallel at Kamado Lowe's, which isn't that far to the north. Hockman uh, actually already pointed this out. I didn't have this brilliant idea on my own. Uh, and Hockman uh, said that the treasury at Kamado Lowe's is a built tomb. Uh, and in fact, uh, Inbal Summit at Tel Aviv wrote a master's thesis pointing this out. And I think that they are absolutely correct and that the treasury is actually a tomb. And that explains why there's a thieving camel that was sacrificed in there, be that as it may. All right, so moving on and ending here. Uh, Gordon Loud actually came back to Chicago, of course, because he's um, based here. And Mary's honor Merrill. They are um, married in the Fourth Presbyterian Church and then had a reception, I think, on Lakeshore Drive, if I remember correctly, and then went to Megiddo for their honeymoon because, of course, it's extremely romantic to be at a dig <laughs> when you've just gotten married. At any rate, um, they went there, and I'm actually in, in touch then with the descendants, uh, two of whom live in Washington, D.C. So this then, uh, in those years, this is when they found the famous round altar, and this is when they took it all the way down to bedrock. And so, as I said, we know all 20 levels that are there. But that was then the beginning of the end. 1938, 1939, they fully thought that they were going to come back. But suddenly, um, life, which has a way of taking strange turns, did so. Uh, and we've got what happens in these letters. You can follow what goes on. I'm not going to read them to you. But in the end, what happened was that Jeffrey Shipton took a job. He said, I'm never going to get hired in archaeology. You're not letting me into Chicago to get my degree. Uh, and so he went off and got a, a job um, at a grocery store chain, lived happily ever after, basically. But that was too few people. They couldn't come back to dig. So they ended up offering it to uh, Tobler in Philadelphia, who said, I can't come. And that was that. The dig suddenly ended. In large part, it was because of World War II, but it was also because they couldn't get enough team members to spend that last season that they had the money for. And then Shipton got married. Married a wonderful woman. Uh, they actually 
Uh, they got married in Haifa, but they held the engagement party at Megiddo. And this is a letter that the chauffeur wrote, Sergei Chub wrote to Loud and described the wedding and the engagement. He said, over 100 people came to Megiddo. The saloon, the ping pong room, the dining room were full of guests. And I'm reading this going, well, great, excellent. Wait a minute, they had a ping pong room? So, yeah, they also had a tennis court, by the way. Did I fail to mention that? Yeah, when, one of the times when, um, when the Breasteads came over, they said, you absolutely need a tennis court. So that went in as a necessary expenditure. But they had ping pong as well. All right, and then um, Harry wrote as well, saying that Jeff was getting married. So they didn't resume the excavations because everybody um, had taken other jobs or were otherwise engaged, if you pardon the pun. Uh, and eventually, even Loud resigned. And these are the letters from 1946 where he stepped away. A lot of the people, a lot of the alumni from the, the team ended up working for gas and oil companies, which might not be surprising, but that's what they made their careers in afterward. So in 1948, this is fact number nine, so we're ending up, uh, the Dick House was looted during, the, during or just after the War of Independence, and then it was burnt down, and the insurance company refused to reimburse them. They actually sold the dig car, uh, and it was sent up to Iraq by the British Army, uh, and then was promptly totaled. And so this is a picture that was sent to them by somebody who saw um, signage in the back of the car saying it had belonged to the Megiddo uh, expedition. And uh, did they want this picture? to know that it was no longer extant. So that happened. Um, as I said, they never got the insurance to pay for it, uh, for anything. This is Tube and Parker uh, and Wilson itemizing everything that had been lost. And so eventually, 1955, when they had been at Megiddo for 30 years by this point, right, they hadn't dug since 1939, but they were fully expecting to come back, and they actually had permission to come back. But in 1955, they finally said, never mind, we're not going to go back, we're going to go elsewhere. And they sold the dig house to the government of Israel, renounced the rights to the site, and they did so for one dollar. And so after 30 years, the OI in Chicago at Megiddo came to an end, and that answered one of my questions, how could Yigal Yadin have started digging there in the 60s well, it's because they sold it to the government of Israel in 1955 for $1. You would think they could have gotten a little more, but they didn't. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I hope it was enjoyable. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.